Now, Spinalis, like I said, Spinalis is the little shorty of the group, kind of like the little sister. And it is um, going to go from SP to SP, spinous process to spinous process. And it starts down here in, it doesn't, although it does use some of the connective tissue down here, but um, books will talk about how it starts in some of those, uh, starts at some of those upper um, lumbar spinous processes. And then it goes spinous, and it doesn't go right on top of them. It kind of does like a little leapfrog, all right, from spinous processes to spinous processes. And it comes all the way up and actually goes up here to the um, spinous processes of the cervical vertebrae, except for C1 is what most books will say. But basically from here, and it likes to lay in that lamina groove. So as it's going from SP to SP, it kind of hangs out in that lamina groove. Um, and that's your spinalis. So that's the most medial aspect of your erector group. Okay, now another assessment we're gonna show you today because it, it relates to the erectors is forward bending, flexion of the spine. When you flex forward, you should be able to keep your pelvis over top your ankle joint and flex your spine like Sarah is demonstrating very well in this picture here. Now, Sarah used to be a professional dancer, but I think once you're a professional dancer, you're always a professional dancer, even though you may not be actively dancing. But this is what you should look like, what we should all look like. Very few of us look like Sarah because very few of us are trained as professional dancers. So what you see is what Melissa is showing us. Melissa has a history. She was a, a gymnast for her, a lot of her adolescent life. And she still has a very gymnast type posture, very extended through her thorax, very tucked under through her pelvis and her abs pulled in. That'll take you into posterior pelvic tilt. And Melissa and I are pretty much the same age. We're both 51. She'll be 52 this year, but we're about the same age. And this is kind of what my, my forward bend looks like. You see less anterior pelvic rotation than Sarah has. You have more spinal flexion than Sarah has. And you see the suboccipital extension or the cervical extension. And if you draw a straight line over the top of the pelvis, you see that Sarah's pelvis stays right over top of her ankles and Melissa's pelvis shifts back. So this, these are common signs that your client has a non-optimal forward bend strategy. Now, why is flexion and forward bending such an important assessment for your client? Because this is what they're doing all day long when they need to bend, bend forward to pick something off the floor, to pick something up out of, the, out of the lower cabinet, to pick up their child. So this is why forward bending is such an important assessment. Now, this is my client, Tom. That's his forward bend. I want you, I'm going to ask you another question. Write down the three signs of a suboptimal bending strategy. Why will this pattern and the way he's doing this pattern cause Tom chronic low back and or shoulder and or neck issues? What are the three things he's doing that shows you it's a non-optimal strategy? What do we got, Jill? I'm waiting because I'm sure this is a lot of tight typing. There's a lot uh, of typing. We got, we got, we got a tight uh, glute. We got tight glutes. Tight glutes, but, but what, what do you see that makes you think that he's got tight glutes? Because that's probably true. But Tight what you, hamstrings. What, what makes you say that? There you go. You Posture tilt, bent knees. Yes, the bent knees. Okay. What, what else tells you that he's, he's tight in his hamstrings? Ooh, and the hip shift anterior. Uh, posterior, you mean. I posterior. know what you're talking about. Yeah, yep. do you see? Remember with Sarah, let me go back just this one slide. Do you see Sarah? Pelvis directly over top her ankle. Mm -hmm. Melissa, starting to transition back. Where's Tom's pelvis? Way behind his ankles. Yep. And this is, this is why one of the most important patterns you have to train in your clients. Number one is what? Breathing. Number two is what? Hip hinging. This is, a, this is not a great hip hinge pattern. This will cause you or cause Tom to overload his low back. Good. So that's the first sign is decrease anterior pelvic rotation with posterior translation of the pelvis. What's the next sign? You got two more. We've got thoracic spine flexion. Yes, increased thoracic spine flexion. If you go back to Sarah again, do you see how there's no area of her spine that's excessively rounded? It's just a nice, smooth, gentle curve, and she has chin tucked. That's a nice, that's a nice spinal flexion. That's what you should have. Compared to Melissa, you see a lot of lumbar spine flexion, and and lower thoracic spine flexion. So and you'll see that in me too, as I show you my assessment in, in a little bit. So again, so that's number two. What's the third thing you see that, that tells you it's a suboptimal strategy? We've got a neck position looks that's strained. Exactly, that's exactly right. You see the extension of the neck. And the reason why your older clients, and well, not even your older clients, but people like me and Melissa will do this as well, is you run out of range of motion. 
I want you to think about your spinal cord and your spot, your, your brain and your spinal cord. So brain up here, obviously in the skull, spinal cord run, running all the way down to your tailbone area, and then your spinal nerves, your sciatic nerve running down the back of your leg and splitting down into your tibial and peroneal branches of, of your nerves coming all the way down to the bottom of your feet. When you have good extensibility, flexibility in your spinal cord and your spinal nerves, you can do what Sarah's doing because this requires a lot of flexibility of the spinal cord and spinal nerves to make this happen. But when you don't, you start shortening up. You start moving the pelvis posteriorly. You start under flexing certain areas. This is a classic sign of neural tension. There's tension somewhere in the nervous system. I don't want to overgo into that. We'll, we teach that much more in, in the certification program. But you, when you see this spinal extension right here, when you see that posterior translation, when you see the knee bend, that's telling you there's nervous system tension. There's spinal stenosis, most likely. There's suboptimal breathing. You also see the distension of the abdomen. If I go back to Sarah, you see that the, the, her abdomen doesn't really distend. You almost see her abs contracting here. Not contracting, but they're shortening. That's what should happen. But when you see Tom, you see distension. He's pushing out. That's a, that's a fourth sign if you want to add that one in. And then you see the extension at the neck. And that's what most of your clients look like when they do their forward bend. And that's why this pattern or forward bending will cause your clients back problems. Stiff legged deadlift is one of our favorite patterns. Every client does some version of this pattern. It's basically just a hip hinge with load. Again, it starts exactly the same way. Align the head and neck, align the thoracopelvic cylinder, hinge. Grab the bar, pull it into your waist, into your hips, I should say. Keep the neck relaxed, hinge, and then pull without over squeezing. Hinge, pull without over squeezing. So if you notice at the top, I'm using my glutes. Let me come back up to the top and stop it. So I'm using my glutes, but I'm not over squeezing my glutes. I'm not driving the pelvis forward and my thorax back. I'm maintaining the cylinder alignment throughout the pattern. So you hinge, drive up, hinge, drive up. You are activating the glutes. You're just not over squeezing the glutes. That's your stiff legged deadlift. Again, extremely safe, the low back, as long as your client is using the most optimal form. Uh, 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 uh.